Hi, my name is John Cullen. I'm one of the pastors here at Southbridge. Thank you so much for checking out our sermons online. Our prayer is that you are challenged by the Word of God and grow in your affections for Christ. We recognize that this can be a great supplement to your personal study, or maybe you simply could not make it to church this week. Our hope, though, is that you're plugged into a local community of faith. So if you live in the Raleigh-Durham area and looking for a church, we would love to meet you on a Sunday and help you get connected. If you are not local, we want to encourage you to find a gospel-centered church in your area. Thank you again for letting us be a part of your week. Enjoy the Word of God proclaimed. Hey, good morning, Southbridge Fellowship. My name is Dallas Jenkins. I happen to be the creator of the show that is part of the sermon series you're doing right now, which is really exciting to me. And the main reason this is exciting is because I love partnering with churches. What is the goal of The Chosen? The Chosen is to get people to know and love Jesus more. Well, what's the next step after that? Worship, discipleship, that's where church comes in. The Chosen is not church. The Chosen is not the Bible. I am not God. Jonathan Rumi, who plays Jesus, is not Jesus. But you are where the church comes in. You are where discipleship happens. You are where the next step is taken after people watch The Chosen. And I've seen literally thousands and thousands of people whose lives have been changed and in fact have come to Christ specifically from watching The Chosen. And then they out, out, outright say over and over again, without exception, I wanna read the Bible more. I wanna pray more. I wanna worship more. And that's what I love about doing things like this with churches like you. So as you watch the show, as you experience the sermon series, lean into this one thing that's very important to me and I think is the, the, the essentially the key message of the show, which is that Jesus wants an intimate relationship with you. Yes, Jesus preached to thousands at times. Yes, Jesus represents and is the son of God of the masses. But he's also, and more importantly, the God of the individual. And in our miracle scenes, in our calling scenes, when Jesus calls a disciple, you'll often see how we film it in a way that makes it very personal and intimate and direct. And we've had people say to us, I feel like that's me. I feel like I'm experiencing that. That's very purposeful because what I've learned in doing this show is that Jesus wants a personal and intimate relationship with you, that he calls you specifically to, to your circumstance and to your personality and to the way that you hear things. He wants that personal relationship. So lean into that as you're taken through this series. I'm so excited about it. Thank you for your partnership. And remember, it's not your job to feed the 5,000. It's only to provide the loaves and fish. I can't wait to see what comes from the sermon series. Good morning, Southbridge. Appreciate that message from Dallas and his greeting to us this morning. It's great to dig into the Word of God. We're gonna continue in our chosen series this morning and as we do, uh, it's just kind of important to know, as, as uh, Pastor Scott has started into this, this series, right, we've, we've looked at uh, the fact that we are chosen to come and see, we are chosen to follow, we are chosen for life, we are chosen for transformation, uh, we are chosen for different. Uh, this morning, we are looking at the fact that we are chosen for greatness. Now, just so uh, you kind of understand, when we talk about being chosen for greatness, it's not the greatness in the sense that you may immediately think. Uh, you're not going to become some superstar, some well-known celebrity. You're not going to become some social media influencer. So here's your big spoiler alert this morning, okay, that uh, our greatness, when we talk about our greatness as followers of Jesus, comes in getting low and humble before the Lord to look more and more like Jesus as we join him on his mission to seek and save the lost. That's why he's chosen us. That's why he's called us. And so as we press in this morning, I have to do one thing for a, a good friend of mine. Uh, and when you have an adorable little 11 year old friend who asks you to do something, you do it. Am I right? Okay, so a couple months ago, Hannah Joy said, hey, someday you need to like wear a do-rag up there and stuff. And I don't know if it was like getting really sweaty that day or what. So this morning when she walked on campus, this was not planned all week. This was not like some bit I worked up all week. This morning she walks on campus and, and she goes, are you teaching today? I said, yeah. She goes, here. So this is for Hannah Joy, okay? <clears throat> Now, I, I should probably just wear it the whole time because I will either sneeze or something, and I'm going to need this, but I, I won't this morning. Um, now, some of you may go, well, that's a little humiliating and humbling, and I'm like, good, because that's the point of our morning, right? Uh, we are getting into the idea of what does it mean to be humble? What is, it, what is humility in the life of a believer? Because that's exactly where we find ourselves. 
uh, in our text this morning is we are chosen for greatness. I love what Dallas said in his greeting to us. He said, the goal of the chosen is to help people know and love Jesus more. We say it all the time here at Southbridge, right? We are passionate about what? Connecting people to Jesus for life change. We're passionate about connecting people to Jesus for life change because in connecting with Jesus, in other words, committing to relationship, Jesus begins to do a work in us that only he can do, right? We, we don't come to Christ and we don't earn our salvation by doing good things and changing behaviors and trying to be a better person. We come to him in our brokenness and our sin and we simply surrender that to him in confession and repentance. He takes up residence in our life and he begins to transform us from the inside out. And so when I think of this calling, when I think of the idea that we are to come humbly before the Lord, uh, I realize wholeheartedly that th this idea of following Jesus was his primary invitation. Jesus said, come and follow me. Mark chapter one and verse 17, he gives us this invitation. And with the invitation, he immediately gives us a description. He says, come and follow me and I will what? Make you become fishers of men, right? So he extends the invitation, but he tells us what's going to happen when that takes place. And so that's his primary invitation. Come and follow me. Come and follow me. Pastor Scott pressed into Matthew chapter 9 in the calling of Levi or Matthew. Come and follow me. We're called to follow him. And, and the Greek rendering there literally is to, to come behind, to follow. To follow or come behind someone in, in both a physical sense and in times an intellectual and, and a religious sense. The idea carries with it uh, the, the, that we are to hold steadfast to that individual that we're following and, and that we are being conformed to the example of that one. So when Jesus invited the disciples to come and follow, they were to hold steadfast, to become like him, to draw close to him, to begin to look more and more like him. Uh, it's much like the idea of parenting. If you are a parent or you've been a child and had a parent or you have simply been around children and you've like walked through the sand or where I grew up, the snow, right? And, and you're walking in the sand or the snow and you look behind you and someone is following your footsteps and, and they're simply trying to step in the, the footprints that you left for them. This worked great um, until a few years ago, I was up in Alaska and my son wanted to climb this area up into this abandoned mine. So there were several of us and I'm following their footsteps because they're the adventurer. They're going a lot faster, but also every time I stepped in their footprint and the snow was like six feet deep. So every time I would, no snowshoes, but every time I'd step in their footprint, I realized I weigh more than they do. So I would press down further and I'm literally like up to my waist and I'm trying to hike and I'm like, forget this. Because I realize for every step I have to go up, I have to make that same step coming back. And as much as I love the snow, I just sort of flopped over in, in this giant drift that I'm in, and they're way up there somewhere. And, and in my mind, in my head, I'm tearing up and I'm thinking, I'm going to die up here, and no one's going to know where I am. And, and so I just flopped on my side and started rolling down the hill. I'm like, I'm not going to fight this, trying to step in these things. But when we think about following Jesus, that's exactly what we're doing. We're following in his footsteps. We're imitating him to become more and more like him. And to follow Jesus means to walk in his steps. To, it means to, to follow the example that he set for us. It means to uh, imitate his very life, to imitate his heart his passion, his character, his behavior. And the whole purpose of Jesus' three to three and a half year ministry was simply to train, to raise up, to equip these men that he called to follow him so that they would look just like him, that they would act just like him, that they would do the things that he did. And that's exactly what happened. That's why Jesus could say in John 17, 4, right before he went to the cross, before he was arrested and put on mock trial and, and crucified, he prayed to the Father and he said, Father, I've completed the work you've given me to do. 
What was that work that was completed? He hasn't been to the cross yet, so what was completed? What was completed was the training of these 12 who would look and act just like Jesus and perpetuate his ministry even into the 21st century. What Jesus did worked, and it still works. So when we look at this, we have to realize just like the disciples here, we are called to be disciples of Jesus. We are chosen to be disciples, to come and see, to follow. We're, we're chosen for life. We're chosen for different. We're chosen for transformation. And yes, we'll see this morning, we're chosen for greatness. But we have to understand that being called to be disciples of Jesus requires a humility, a humbleness of heart that, that recognizes that I still have a long way to go. I have a lot to learn. This is a lifelong journey. I never come to the arrival. I never come to the completion of this journey with Jesus while I'm still here. But because I belong to Jesus, because I am following him, I will go where he leads me. I will follow in his steps. And, and, and in so doing, he may send me to places and situations that I don't particularly care for or care about, but I will follow him in obedience because I am choosing to be his disciple. I'm choosing to follow him, even when that's a hard place to go. The more I've grown in my relationship with Christ and the more I've done all I can to serve the body of believers and make a difference with my life for the mission of Jesus, uh, I become more and more convinced that Jesus himself is the model for ministry. I think we've done a great disservice in, in especially the American church over the last many decades trying to create something that was not Jesus. Pastor Scott hit on that a little bit over the last uh, beginning of this series, but Jesus himself is the very model for ministry. See, when we look throughout Scripture, we are told to do several things. Uh, we're told to walk as Jesus walked. We're told to do what Jesus did. We're told to think as Jesus thought. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, whoever says he abides in him, that's Jesus, ought to walk in the same way in which he did. John chapter 14 Verse 12, Jesus himself is speaking. He says, verily, verily. In other words, hey, guys, this is really important. He said, I say to you, whoever believes in me, that is to surrender or choose to follow me, will also do the works that I do. We're supposed to do the things that Jesus did. We're supposed to think as Jesus thought. Philippians chapter 2, as Paul is writing to the church, he says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mind as Christ." You see, Jesus wants you to look and act like him. Jesus wants you to look and act just like him. So I love in, in Acts chapter 4, when we get to verse 13, now the Pentecost has already happened, the Holy Spirit's come, God is doing some incredible things, people are coming to Jesus. Here stands in verse 13, now when they, that's the religious leaders, right, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived, I love this, that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. I love that. Because what I see is these religious leaders who wanted Jesus put to death and got their way, and they, they literally, when you read through the Gospels, you can see the, the storyline. Hey, let's just do away with him just like the others and all of his followers will go away. Well, that's not what happened. Instead, something very different happened. All of a sudden, Jesus did exactly what he said he would do. He said he was God. He said he would rise again from the dead. He said that he will send you the promised Holy Spirit and that things are going to change. Things are going to get different. And that's exactly what took place. But I love this because here's these religious leaders, and I'm sure they're over going, holy cow, these guys look and talk and sound and act and walk just like Jesus. We thought we did away with him, but here are these guys, and they look and sound and talk and act and walk just like Jesus. But what were they? They were ordinary uneducated, common men, so that these guys were astonished. And I love that they says, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. 
See, that's what Jesus wanted for his disciples. And can I just tell you this morning, that's exactly what Jesus wants for us. He wants people to look at us as his church and go, you guys have been with Jesus. Your life is different. There's something different about you. You must have been with Jesus. But I'm afraid more often than not, what ends up happening is that people don't necessarily recognize that you or I have been with Jesus as much as we've attended a church service. See, sometimes people will look and, and, and they won't say, hey, you must have been with Jesus, but they will say, hey, I saw you attended a church or I saw you went to a gathering or you did this or this, but there's no reflection of Jesus in that. Do people recognize that you have been with Jesus? I think the Apostle Paul understood this very well. He said to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, follow my example as I follow Christ. How many of you have the boldness and courage to say that to someone? You're walking a journey with them. They're fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus. You're in small group. You're discipling. You're pouring your life into them. How many of you have the courage to say, you follow my example as I follow Jesus? See, that's the boldness. That's the courage of saying, I have been with Jesus. My life is different because I've been with Jesus. The writer of Hebrews understood it as we looked at that series earlier this year in chapter three. He says, therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. He goes on in chapter 12. He says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. In other words, everything about us should be fixed on Jesus. Why? Because we're following him, which means where he goes, I go. Where he puts his feet, I put my feet. The things that he would do if he were here are the things that I step into and do. I am simply following him. Obviously, Jesus was intended to be our focus as followers. And in order to do that, you have to take a serious and hard look at the life and the ministry of Jesus. We have to constantly look at him and who he was. This is the ongoing, the lifelong journey of a disciple of Jesus. But in our text this morning, what we discover is that although this is our, our passion and this is our focus, something happens when sinful people come together to grow in Jesus. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but there's difficulty in church life. Anybody? Anybody with me? There's tension in church life. There's disagreements in church life. There's division in church life. Why? Because we take our eyes off Jesus. That's exactly what we see in Matthew chapter 18 as we look in this morning. Because Jesus begins to address some of the tension that's happening with his guys, right? They're following him, they're walking with him. And if you just think for a moment of all the stuff that they've walked away from, they dropped their nets, they left everything to follow him. Matthew left the tax booth. We saw that, you know, and in Matthew 9, and, and these guys are just, man, they're all in, but all of a sudden they've been there for a while. And all of a sudden there's some tension that begins to build up. And so in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus begins to address three critical things that, that are needed for health in a church. We're only going to get to the first one this morning, but I just want you to be aware because you could probably read through this and just get, a, get an understanding of what it means to live in fellowship with the body of believers. Because it says we need humility, we need honesty, we need forgiveness. We need humility, we need honesty, we need forgiveness. But at the very beginning, we press into this idea of humility. Now, first off, just to understand, humility is simply to go down low. We saw it last week as we uh, installed some new deacons and uh, we looked at the, the ministry of Jesus who went down low. He served. And that's what we're called to do, to, to take upon ourselves the mind of Christ and to humble ourselves, to serve. And, and so the, this idea of humility literally means to be brought low. Now, a few weeks ago when I was kind of reading this passage, <clears throat> I kind of realized that humility and humiliation come from the same root word. Humility, if I choose to take on humility, I choose to go low. When I choose not to, humiliation jumps all over me and it takes me low anyway. And most of the time by surprise, right? So if we're not living in humility and humbleness before the Lord, sometimes God will bring that upon us in a way that is not pleasing. Anybody with me? 
one simple story of humiliation in my life, and I have so many. Um, if you want to take me to lunch sometime, I'll share many stories of humiliation. But several years ago, I was in Moscow, Russia with a team. Um, it was January in Moscow, so it was a little chilly, which I love. I married a Texan. She loves the heat. I love the cold. And, and so all day, we've been on and off this little rickety bus visiting some children's hospitals and, and children's orphanages and just ministering to them, sharing the love of Jesus. So on and off all day. And as you can imagine, the steps on that old crickety bus getting on and off and on and off got a little icy through the day. And so as a good bus captain that I was, as we got back to the hotel in Moscow, this was the end of a two-week trip. So we had hundreds of people from around Russia that were part of this trip with us. And we were all gathering, about 300 of us total, coming back to this hotel where we were staying that night. We had a dinner. And so it was pretty crowded. And so being the good servant that I, I took upon myself, I wanted to make sure everyone was off the bus. And so I, I went off carefully and I'm, I'm helping everyone down the bus and everyone's off. And I'm like, yeah, that was awesome. Good job, Dave. So I go back on and I'm retrieving boxes of supplies that we had left. And so here I am, I'm walking through this crickety old bus. It's about 20 below and, and uh, I'm getting, and I get to the stairs of the bus. And you know where I'm going with this story, right? And I'm thinking, those are really icy. And it's a pretty big size box. And so I'm, I'm going and, and I get to the edge and I'm like, oh. So I can't see, but I get my foot out there and it's like, oh, step one, I'm, I'm good. Step two, step three. I make it to the ground. I made it to the ground. What I didn't realize is the bus stopped right in front of a planter that was sitting right there. I couldn't see it. I'm holding this box and, and I couldn't see the planter, but I was so proud of myself. I'm on concrete. And I just, I go like this. My right foot clears the planter. My left foot gets hung up. And for whatever reason, I was tr trying to protect this cardboard box. I went over the top of this planter and I'm like tumble rolling all over. It smashes my fingers. I think I broke one finger, but like all my, I'm like protecting it. And so it goes down. I land on the box. My fingers busted. It's bleeding. Uh, they're swollen. Bryce, I was leading some songs in worship at our dinner that night. So I'm thinking, what song can I play? What chord can I play with these two fingers? Because that's all I got left, you know? But it was like, and, and it, if it were just me, but there were at least three dozen people standing outside the front of this hotel. Some gasped, some clapped, right? Some clapped, they're like, that, very impressive. That was awesome, you know? But in that moment, I was like, oh, God, I mean, that was just humiliating. That was one of many. I have a, a, just a lifetime of stories of great humiliation that God has taught me. But there is a difference between humility and humiliation, right? So as Jesus is, is unpacking these truths, right, humility, honesty, forgiveness throughout Matthew chapter 18, he says these things are vitally important because when you begin to disconnect from the mission, something has happened in your walk with Jesus. You've stopped following him the way he intended for you to follow. And so without these things, uh, as, as a follower of Jesus, we become discontent. We become a little indifferent. We become dissatisfied. Uh, we become disconnected from his mission because we're no longer following him. And what happens is this, and maybe, maybe you will relate to this this morning. Church attendance becomes optional or extracurricular. Investing in the lives of others becomes optional or extracurricular. Serving one another becomes optional or extracurricular. Using your gifts to serve others, having a passion for the mission of Jesus, all of a sudden becomes kind of optional or extracurricular. If that's you, you've disconnected from the mission. You're not following the way he intends for you to follow. So Matthew chapter 18, uh, as Matthew is writing and retelling us the life of Jesus, he simply says this, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse four, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So this morning, very quickly, I want to give you three things that I believe we become discontent in our calling when first and foremost, we forget why we were chosen. 
You're going to become discontent in the mission of Jesus. Your participation in the gospel, your investing in others, your gathering with others will become optional or extracurricular when you forget why you were chosen. Look at verse 1. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus. What time was that? We don't know. But here's what we do know. I heard a guy years ago, much, much smarter than me, and, and he said, all of the Gospels, when we look at the life of Jesus laid out in the Gospels, uh, of a three to three and a half year ministry, the time that is given in the Gospels is roughly three to four months. That's why John could say, man, there's so many more things, but, it, you know, the, the world wouldn't even hold if we wrote down everything that Jesus did. So we don't know at this point how long these guys have been following Jesus. But here's what I think happened. At that time, they got excited, they were following Jesus, and then all of a sudden something set in. What are we doing? Why am I here? Where are we going? This is not what I thought it might have been. The Gospels actually tell us at different times that some of the disciples went back fishing. Jesus went and retrieved them. There was a disconnect. Something happened in their head and their heart at this moment that disconnected them from the mission. And see, when we forget why we were chosen, all of a sudden we move from following to leading. When we forget why Jesus chose us to follow him, all of a sudden the, the plan shifts. And instead of following Jesus, I begin to lead Jesus. Hey, Jesus, come on this way. Hey, Jesus, I want to go do this. So would you please bless this? Because this sounds like a really awesome plan. God, I really want to do this, so would you just bless this because it really seems like a neat thing. God, I'm really praying about a, a, a beach ministry in Hawaii. God, would you, would you just bless that idea? Not that he could, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. But, but, but we move from following Jesus to leading Jesus. Uh, when we forget why we were chosen, we lose sight of the mission and we become distracted by other things. But when Jesus calls us to follow, he says, lay it all down. Take up your cross daily and follow me. When we stop doing that, other things become a distraction. God, the car I drive is just not the car that is appealing to my neighbors, and I need something different. So to, to get a little extra money, instead of doing other things, I'm going I'm to give up life group. I'm going to give up discipleship because I want to put in a few more hours to do something I want to do. And again, not that those things are wrong in and of themselves, but do they become a distraction to the mission of Jesus? We, we begin to replace his mission with our own mission. See, nowhere in Scripture do we ever have this promise that, or, or even a command that we are to go grow the church of Jesus. Jesus said, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll grow my church. You grow people. You disciple people. I'll grow my church. But well, what happens is we begin to compare ourselves with others, either other people or other churches or other ministries, and we begin to replace his mission with our own mission. We begin to compare ourselves to others, and we also begin to live in the past. I'm sure probably at this moment in these guys' life, they were like, man, you remember, remember when we first started following Jesus? It was awesome. Remember that cool thing he did? And I don't know, but it's like th there was a, a forgetting moment. Stop and think for just a moment. <clears throat> At that time, the disciples asked Jesus, who is the greatest? Really? Do you know who you're talking to? Come and follow me. <clears throat> I look at this much like muscle memory. Um, how many of you have ever driven a car? <clears throat> how many of you remember like when you first started driving a car? <clears throat> Were you a little nervous? I mean, be honest with me. Maybe a little nervous? Thank you, Micah, for being honest, Jim. The rest of you are liars because it's like, we're, we're nervous, right? We got this expensive piece of equipment. And truthfully, if you weren't a little nervous, your dad probably didn't spank you, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> When, when I started driving, I was a little nervous. I'll just be honest. And you get in the car, man, and it's like, mm, am I doing this right? You know? And I don't know, some of you, you, you probably don't remember a stick. You don't remember three on the tree, 
right? I mean, you know, so I mean, I, I learned driving like an old Dodge and, a, and an old Chevy truck and, you know, my 65 T-Bird, which was automatic, and that was cool. And, but, you know, I mean, it's like, man, you're, you're just nervous. And there was a caution when you started to drive. How many of you have the same caution and concern now when you get in the car that you had when you first got your driver's license and you first drove all by yourself? Roads are scary. I am more afraid of other drivers, right? But I don't have the same concerns that I did at 15, 16 years old because it's become so common to me. And, and there are moments that God will wake me up and go, you are an idiot, <laughs> right? Um, I've had near-death experiences in the car because my muscle memory, and I'm not, even, I'm not even thinking about some things. And in some ways, you know what? That's exactly what happens in our walk and our relationship with Jesus Christ. It becomes muscle memory. It's what we do. We don't put the same intent into it. We don't put the same passion into it. We don't put the same devotion into it that we once had. And so what happens is we begin to drift. Does that sound familiar? Hebrews, we said it over and over and over. Pastor Scott, don't drift, don't drift. But we begin to drift because we become so complacent and, and our walk with Jesus is less about the personal intimacy that he desires and we forget why we were chosen and, and we begin to drift from him and muscle memory begins to kick in and it's like, yeah, I really didn't spend time with Jesus in his word, but I'm going to go to church. Now, that's a good thing. Don't get me wrong, but going to church is not the answer. It's a great place to find the answers. So as we press into a relationship with Jesus, we can't forget why we were chosen. Now, I have to believe in Matthew chapter 18 that Peter was part of this argument. I just have to believe it. It doesn't mention him specifically, but the way I create Peter in my head, Peter was there. What, you think you're better than me? Right? I mean, who knows? It doesn't tell us how many. It just says the disciples. The disciples came to Jesus. Now, they didn't just come to Jesus with a question. It had been simmering down below somewhere for a little while. No, you don't. I'll go ask Jesus because I'm like special, you know. Who knows the tension that was going on with these guys? But I have to believe that Peter was somewhere in the mix, don't you? Are you with me? Peter just had to be. But here's what I love because Peter, even though he very well may have been a part of the argument here, Later, we see that he obviously learned exactly what Jesus wanted him to learn. First Peter chapter 5, in verse 5, he simply says this, clothe yourselves. This is Peter writing, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Where did Peter learn that? He learned it in the presence of Jesus. It was Peter who last week when we looked at John 13 said, no, 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 Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet. And he said, if I'm not going to wash your feet, then I have, you have nothing to do with me. Oh, well, don't, don't just stop with my feet. Wash all of me. Peter was learning lessons in the presence of Jesus. But I believe at this moment, the disciples missed the point. They forgot why they were chosen. They were chosen to begin to look and act and walk and talk just like Jesus. That's why we saw it happen in Acts chapter 4. Peter and John, these guys have obviously been with Jesus. We become discontent in our calling when we forget why we are chosen. Secondly, I want you to see that when we forget our position in Christ. When we forget our position in Christ, all of a sudden we become discontent, disconnected with the mission. Verse 2 says, in calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them. Jesus immediately grabbed the child. Now, this is actually a continuation of the dialogue Jesus was having in Matthew 17. They were in the temple, and, and the guys were like, hey, doesn't your, doesn't your teacher uh, pay a temple tax? Sure he does, yeah. Okay, hey, go down to the lake and catch this fish, and in the fish's mouth is going to be these gold coins. Are you kidding? <laughs> Are you kidding? Who is this guy? And it's going to be just enough gold coin to pay the temple tax. Then he says, so who, you know, who, do, who do they tax? Do they tax their children or do they tax others? They go, they tax others. Jesus says, that's why I call you children. 
So he continues that dialogue right here by bringing in a little child and he simply reminds them that you are mine. You are my child. And and he puts this young child uh, in in the middle of them as this object lesson. Now we could look at that and, and as a parent, I could tell you a lot of things about children. Right? They're rambunctious, they're wild, they're crazy, uh, they they take risks, they do all these things, but Jesus tells us very specifically what he wants us to learn from this child, and that is the humility and humbleness of this child. He's not challenging them to take risks, he's not challenging them to do all these other things, he's telling them that they simply need to be humble like this child. The humility of a child consists of childlike trust. I remember when my children were small and just that childlike trust as they were humbly walking with me and living in my home and expecting and anticipating my care for them. And so there was this childlike trust. There's there's also a vulnerability. As parents with our children, there's, there's a vulnerability. They're totally vulnerable, and we, we have to care for them. We have to nurture them and, and cherish them. As a child, the humility of a child brings with it this inability to advance his or, ho- his or her own agenda or his or her own cause apart from the help, the direction, and the resources of a parent. So what is Jesus telling these disciples in this moment? He's saying, look, guys, You have to be like this child. You have to have a childlike trust in me. You have to have a vulnerability in me. You have to realize that you are unable to advance your own cause or the cause of Jesus Christ, the mission of God, apart from my help, from my direction, and all the resources that come from me alone. Without saying it, he's like, guys, this is not about you. You're standing here wondering who's the greatest in the kingdom. It's not you. Because you're not going to do a single thing apart from me. I can't help think of this and and think of Psalm 100. Because what Jesus is saying, he says, guys, you're, you're like children. You have to understand your role as a child. To be fully dependent on me. And the psalmist in Psalm 100 simply said, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people. We're the sheep of his pasture. Jesus is saying, guys, it's not about you. It's about me. You are mine. I have called you to be with me. I've called you to follow me. I've called you to become like me. So don't forget your position with me. So then he goes on in in verse 2, and calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you, a couple of critical words here, turn. Turn, circle that, underline that, highlight that in your Bible. That becomes important. He says, unless you turn and become like. You have to turn and you have to become like children. You will never enter. He didn't even say, this is about being the greatest in the kingdom. He said, if you don't turn and become like, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So turn, turn is is a word literally means to turn around. It's similar, it's not the same word, there's a couple different words used for repentance, but this creates the idea of turning from myself and my sin to someone, which is Jesus. That's exactly what he's telling him to do. Unless you take your eyes off yourself and your greatness and turn away from your sin and yourself to someone, that's me, you're not even going to enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, and then when you turn, right, that's repentance, that's turning away from my own desires, my own sin, and walking away from that, leaving it all to follow you, that's repentance. I'm turning to you from sin and self to someone, that's Jesus, and become like. The tense that Jesus uses here is is not something that you do for yourself, it is something that is done to you and for you. You turn in repentance from your sin and you become like. Why? Because I'm doing a work in you that you can't do yourself. He's not saying you do it in in, in hopes that God is going to accept you and love you, right? That's religion. We can't do anything in hopes that God is going to love us. Ephesians 2, for by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. 
Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. So this is not, hey, turn away from all that stuff and start doing better. No, it's turn away from your sin and yourself, turn to my greatness, and let me begin to do a work in you that you can't do for yourself. Thirdly, I want you to just see that we become discontent in the mission when we forget who Jesus is. For a split second at least, these disciples lost perspective on who Jesus is. It, it's hard to me. Part of me, I'll just be really honest for a moment, part of me is like, what a bunch of idiots that they would even look at Jesus and ask a question like that. Am I, am I right? You're talking to Jesus, the Son of God, the one who's done all these miracles, and you're asking him who's going to be the greatest. And I... I'll just be real honest. I kind of copped an attitude with the guys in this passage until Jesus goes, Dave, that's you. That's you. And I, I started just reflecting on my life. And I thought, what an idiot. <laughs> These guys were idiots just like me. Because every day of my life is this choice to turn from my sin and myself and to trust Jesus. And I can't tell you how many times I've attempted things on my own in hopes that God is going to do something. Or I've trusted myself more than I've trusted Jesus. I've walked with myself and, and attempted to lead Jesus more than I followed him. So as soon as I wanted to beat these guys up, the Holy Spirit started beating me up. Not in a bad way, don't get me wrong. It was a beautiful moment of God just going, Dave, it's you, it's your sin. Turn. Don't forget who I am. You can't do anything apart from me. Nothing. And humility simply comes, verse 4, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And when I pressed into that verse, I thought, nobody can do that but Jesus. Nobody can do that truly except Jesus. Jesus. And, and the more I read into that, I thought, Jesus is telling these guys, none of you are capable of doing this, but I am. And none of you are fully capable of that absolute dependent and transparency except him. He's the child of God. He is God incarnate, the son of God. And humility then comes in knowing who Christ is and that he has chosen me for a personal and intimate relationship. That in that moment, God knows my brokenness and he knows my inability to even be that humble before him. And what does he do? Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for me and for you in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's great. And the only way I become great is to become humble and absolutely dependent on the Lord God, the King of Kings. Paul writes to the church in Philippians these words, and I'm going to close. He begins in verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. But he didn't stop there. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What do I do? I humble myself before that Jesus. I walk in his footsteps. Never forget why I'm chosen Never forget who he is. Our takeaway this morning, if there's something you just walk out of here with, I want you to understand this. Jesus wants a personal and intimate relationship with you. This God, this great and mighty God, 
who is above all and in all, and one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord, right now he gives you that invitation to come to him very freely. He loves you that much. Yes, he knows all your stuff. Yes, he knows all your baggage. Yes, he knows your sin. He knows everything there is about you, and he still loves you. And I love the way Dallas said, yes, he is the God of the multitudes, but he is the God of the individual, and he loves you so much. Would you bow your heads in an attitude of prayer as we draw our time to a close this morning? In just a moment, the team is going to lead us in a great song as we simply proclaim his goodness together. And with your head bowed, doing business with the Lord right now, if you're attending with us online, if you're in the room, as you do business with the Lord, in just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to proclaim these words. Jesus, and in the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died. And the church of Christ was born, then the spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and by his name, in his freedom I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of Kings. Father, you are a great and mighty God. Let us never forget why you have chosen us and let us never forget who you are. God, would you do a work in our hearts and lives in this moment? We love you and praise you in the precious, great and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining our sermons online. We hope to see you in person soon. Our location and service times can be found at our website, sfchurch.com. If God has stirred your heart today and you'd like someone to pray with, or if you'd like more information about Jesus, please take a moment and email us at info at sfchurch.com. Thank you again. God bless.